get started. So I asked you today to think about this as the last chapter, and is it good or not? I used to not like this as the last chapter, in part because of the last words of the chapter. What will the next two decades bring? How will anthropologists use the tools of our discipline to understand the impact of these changes on people and their communities around the globe? You don't want to know that. That's like the, the bad question. I mean, even if, you know, I guess if you're, this is like it was written toward graduate anthropologists or something. You don't care about this, right? I don't even think I care about it. Two decades? Well, from some of you, I feel like we can't even make it for two years, let alone two decades. So this is, that well, seems like a silly question. So that's one, I mean, it isn't the official end of the book. He then has one of those thinking like an anthropologist sections, which I'll talk about. I want to give you a flavor of a of a different kind of ending from a book I used to assign about 10 years ago. And they were talking about how they, we had this freedom and constraint and anthropology helps us understand the freedom and constraint. And this tension of freedom and constraint lies our future. It is up to us to create it. See, now that, doesn't that sound exciting? Yeah, maybe too exciting though. Maybe it's too much. Especially because what's happened since 2012? Nothing good. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, those are the last words. He's not like this chapter for part of it because of the way it ended. I also wanted to give you a flavor of how we used to end things in the class. We used to always end things, or textbooks did, with a chapter that was kind of like applying anthropology. It was like, okay, you've studied all this stuff, and now here's how you apply it in the world. Um, Guest, I think, tries to do this more at the end of each chapter in his thinking like an anthropologist sections, but it used to be kind of a whole chapter. It was also, for the most part, I guess, I think it was pretty boring. For a long time, every anthropology textbook ended with this big chapter on globalization, like changes in the world today. This is how the world is changing. As we talked about at the very beginning, Guest basically incorporates all of that into all of his chapters now, so it doesn't end the thing. Although I think the whole idea of globalization may be in some ways going away. Some people, and we could have done this, we could have ended it on health and medical anthropology. Some people like to end it there and talk about the implications for the world health, or some people are starting to end their books with a sustainability chapter, how it is for the environment. And we could have ended, I mean, he could have chosen those to end us there, but no, he has chosen art and media, which it seems like those of you who wrote, you thought this was a good idea. So I guess I'm just gonna agree with you. I'm gonna say, yeah, that was a great idea. But I'm not, I'm still suspicious of it. I'm also kind of, PJ, you had a funny reason, I thought, for why you thought this was a good chapter to end on. Because all the rest of the chapters were boring up till this one. No, I, no, I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see that. It was an interesting, it was an interesting take on this. So yeah, we start out though, well, you said we know all of it about art, but in fact, we start have to start off with this question of what actually is art? What is art anyway? Because in fact, anthropology has been one of the, the main players, not the only player, but one of the main players in taking this idea that art is something that only the top of society has and only the elite people and people who go to museums and keep people who have resources out to this idea that everybody has art. And so he gives us the example, Guest gives us the example of something going on in a cave in South Africa like 75,000 years ago or 100,000 years ago. You gonna go to this cave, you think? I don't know. You don't know. No, I don't think there's much to see there, but Anyway, there's been a lot of really interesting discoveries about the origins of artistic 
or artistic production and things going on in South Africa. Now, you may wonder why he began with that, because why is he trying to begin back in South Africa 75,000 to 100,000 years ago? Who is he fighting against here that you usually begin with and say your art history classes? Who he does include? What's the point here? Going way back to South Africa. Yeah. What is considered art? Yeah, but I'm thinking like a series, like the first, when you walk down into Dr. Zulo's class down there in Anderson and you're peering up, what is the first thing you're going to see? You're going to see those cave paintings in France. That's the first thing they always show you, those 30,000 year old cave paintings and they say, art, here it is. And then they go on from there. So by saying it was 75,000 years ago in South Africa, what you're saying is, hey, wait a second, you France, you people in Europe and th think you're so cool. We're, we've been cool before that. And in fact, I'm surprised you didn't use this example, which came from 2019 or 20 around there, when they found in Indonesia, off in Indonesia, they found 40,000 year old, or they analyzed, and there's always some debate about how actually old these are, but there's 40,000 year old or around there, animal cave art in Indonesia. So take that art history. Anyway, the point is everybody has art, even in Indonesia. Now, this relates to something that some of you talked about, you know, we've been accumulating these anthropological tools along the way. And I would say that the tool of taking something like art and saying, oh, that's what you think only these top elite Western people have, but actually it's everybody, uh, is one of the biggest tools that anthropology has or the thing that anthropologists do all the time. It's like the big hammer of anthropology. So we go from we the civilized have fill in the blank, we're going to fill it in with art for now, to everyone has art, and we're going to demonstrate all these wonderful examples of art around the world. In fact, you might say that this was the key innovation of anthropology in general. The first thing that anthropology did that meant anything in the world, what was the first blank that was filled in there? Hint, hint, it's in the title of this class. Culture. Culture. We go from only the top people can drink their champagne and look at museums and do that to culture is everyone has and that's the way we become human. This is probably the biggest move that anthropology has ever made. But we can make it with various things like language. There are many people who thought that only certain languages belonged as languages and that everybody else didn't have a language or economics or politics or religion or kinship. All of these things have been relativized by anthropology. That is to say, taken from this thing that people are like, oh, only we have those to extend to various places in the world. Now, the relativizing hammer is still sometimes needed in today's world. There are times at which you need the relativizing hammer to convince people that, no, there are actually other ways of looking at the world, and those ways are important. However, for any of you who has ever had a younger sibling, or maybe you were this person yourself, or maybe you babysat somebody who first discovered a hammer. And when a kid discovers a hammer, what do they start doing? <laughs> yeah, they hammer everything. In fact, there's an old saying about this that if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So the thing is, is the hammer of relativism or the hammer of cultural relativism has been good but kind of maybe overused. It also, I think we can be fairly confident by now 
in saying that the idea of cultural relativism has worked for a bit. It's been successful in certain places, but in general, there are huge areas of US society which have either rejected it or never did it or won't ever want to do it. And you could say that we just need to educate people. We could say that, oh, they need to come to college and learn these things. But in fact, if we look out at, say, the people who are most dealing in, uh, in various forms of, of anti-immigrant speech, of anti, uh, of, of, I guess I'll just say straight up uh, racist ideologies, a lot of them were from Ivy League schools and they had the t access to the highest education. I mean, they should have, I don't know what they were doing there, but they, they list their degrees on their resumes. So if that is true, it does not seem to have worked at the upper levels of our society, I don't know what we'd expect for anybody else. The other thing, as we'll talk about a little bit, it actually can backfire in terms of when people try to do it in a certain way. There's a great example of this, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But so again, in, in general, anthropology has, this has been the big, the big hammer that we use to try and wake people up to different cultures and appreciate other cultures. Fortunately, I think for me, because I, I think it's clear that simply saying culture has not, has not helped us enough. And so I, I think in this book, that in every chapter, and some of you mentioned this, you're about to get called upon, in every chapter, guess keeps the relativizing tool close to another tool. I'll call it a wrench. Which is what, Tiana? What does he always say? He always says, culture and then what? Maybe I'm extracting something from your, from your thoughts that you're not thinking about right now. But throughout the course, you have been thinking about it. You always have to keep culture close to... Power! Yay! Woo! <laughs> you know, and I think he's kept that really close and tight. And I think it was you back in the day who said you'd never heard about, uh, what was it? Hegemony, some, some sort of power thing. You'd heard about it in other places, but not in anthropology. But here we talked about it all the time, I think. And so my feeling is that after reading this textbook, if we read the textbook, we're unable to just go away from it and say, oh, I learned about different cultures. Because he is always keeping that power, that power tool right next to culture, close enough that even if he relativizes and gives us some culture examples, it's around. And there's something else, Amy, that he keeps right, right, right next to culture. Intersectionality. intersectionality. Now, he doesn't always use the word intersectionality, and I don't know if he should use the word intersectionality, but he certainly does talk about the intersections, I think that was in your quote, of things like race, ethnicity, class, gender, sexuality, politics, religion, and economics, which is to say well, you can't just talk about culture without talking about how it appears differently or is it it is differently accessed. And again, we're talking about power. We could talk about this as, you know, being multi-dimensional, different ways of thinking about power. But I think that what is nice about this textbook, and I finally, I think, uh, Guest has gotten the formula a bit tweaked to the extent that you, that if people ask you, what was that class about? When I've previously taught it, people were like, oh yeah, we talked about culture. And now I think you'd at least be able to say about these, you know, whether you use the word intersectionality or not, or whether the word power is at the tip of your tongue, you're, I think, at least going to be tuned into those issues. Or at least that's my hope. Now, there are also a couple of things that I really liked in this chapter that brought us back to the beginning of the class. Elvis, you talked about one of those. Where, what was your example from this chapter? What did guests talk about here? 
Yeah. Where are they at? <laughs> no, I mean, where where in the world are they at? In Haiti. Yeah, no, I mean, I thought I thought it was nice that if you remember, we talked about Haiti in the very first class. We talked about Saint Domingue and the production of coffee and the production of sugar. And Haiti has been kind of a recurrent theme throughout the class. And in this chapter, he brings up the work of Gina Athena Ulysse, who is one of my most favorite anthropologists. She's a Haitian, Haitian American anthropologist who is also a performance artist and just does some really interesting stuff. I think that Haiti is, is a place that's such a wonderful and beautiful place. And the people are so wonderful and beautiful and creative. And yet they've fallen into a, an, a, to a terrible political abyss, which I find difficult to get out of. But at least in this, in this part of the textbook, um, Guest brings us back to Haiti and brings us back to that example. The other example that I really like is on pages 682 to 684. And it's been in several editions of this textbook. It's the one that's called Art Exhibitions and Displays of Power, Playing the Humanity Game. And he's used it for a number of years now, but I think it's even more my favorite now than it was before. And it describes how these museum, these, this museum exhibit tried to put up Middle Eastern and Islamic art. And so they were trying to bridge people's ideas about humanity and trying to make art as a kind of common humanity between Middle Eastern, Islamic art, and, and Western art. And so they put up this big Middle Eastern art exhibit. The thing was, is most of the people that they chose to display for the display were women. And again, there's nothing wrong with choosing women in art, and especially in representations of the Islamic world. But as Guest writes uh, on page 683, missing was art representing resistance to occupation, music critical of the United States or Israel, political cartoons and graffiti, graphic art from Islamic publications, and even the genre of martyr posters and videos, all representing cultural practices involving significant creativity. So what our anthropologist Winnegar, I think her name is, is saying is, is they chose only a subsection of Islamic art, mostly that was that was produced by women. And so the, the viewers of this art interpreted this as uh, women artists who were critical of Islam, who were critical of, of the Muslim uh, religion. And so they saw themselves as supporting this critique of Middle Eastern, uh, basically Middle Eastern society. And so what Guest and Winnegar wonder here is that, you know, while they were trying to say, oh, we're bridging to people's humanity, they actually end up assuming or reinforcing assumptions about, oh, yeah, they're, you know, those people in, in Muslim societies, they oppress their women, and that's why we need to do this, you know, war on terror stuff. Um, so, in fact, the whole thing ends up in some ways backfiring or playing against it against itself. And so this is something that you actually always have to be careful of is if you're aiming your exhibit or your or your intervention at a certain set of assumptions, you just have to watch out that it doesn't doesn't come back to get you. So those are a couple of my favorite examples from that chapter. As is often the case, Guest ends this with his thinking like an anthropologist section. He says, thinking like an anthropologist about the world of art can give you more complete set of tools for comprehending this complex part of human culture. This is actually his very last sentence of the book. However, there's something super missing here. we were supposed to be doing in this chapter. Remember what this chapter was? What's missing? Hint, the title. 
What is the title of the chapter? Oh. And media. where's the media? What? Well, wait a second. What happened to the media? Right? I don't know. Who knows what happened to the media? In fact, it's kind of curious in this chapter. It's kind of weird. On the one hand, we've been asking what is art and how does art work for many, many pages, many pages about art. And we finally get to media. And then he says on page 1691, one of you quoted this, it's not here, media is reshaping human life in every part of the world as it increasingly permeates the routines of daily life. That's pretty huge. If that's true, maybe we need a few more pages on it, you know? We need some stuff on it. So what's the deal with this media stuff? Don't know. The memes. I want to know about the memes. So uh, guest talks about the global mediascape, the global mediascape. And he talks about it as bridging, connecting places, borders, and you know, connecting people. However, I think I'm very suspicious that the global mediascape is actually connecting us. I have an example for you. It comes from a little bit ago. It's not too old but it's not today either. <laughs> when Amy Coney Barrett was appointed, or, you know, when she was about to go through her Senate hearings, this meme came out. On the top is Amy Coney Barrett, who was a known Catholic, and not just a Catholic, kind of a, specific set of Catholicism. And so the meme seems to be saying, oh, the bottom picture is uh, Representative Ilhan Omar from Minnesota, who was one of the few uh, Muslim Americans in the US House of Representatives. So what the meme seems to be saying, this came out from the right side of the political spectrum, is that they believed that they were going, that the Senate confirmation was going to attack Amy Coney Barrett because of her religious beliefs, but nobody cares about Ilhan Omar's religious beliefs. And so they were saying, aha, see, her religion is a problem, but hers isn't, dot, dot, dot. Now, in an objectively world, we actually know that Amy Coney Barrett was not attacked for her Catholic beliefs. And we know that Ilhan Omar is constantly under attack for her beliefs. So it was kind of weird to see this meme, but some people seem to live in this world. The funny thing was, is I'm not sure which of these memes came first. From the left side, they use the same pictures and swap the words around. Or they, you know, I guess they swap the pictures around. And so I think the left was saying, hey, I, right, they're just like swapping it around. And they're saying, hey, you guys are always picking on Ilhan Omar, but you never examine Amy Coney Barrett. So that's a problem. Now, if you lived on one side of the political spectrum, you only got one set of these memes. If you lived on the other side of the political spectrum, you got the other side of these memes. Since I grew up in Montana, I have Facebook friends from both sides of the political spectrum. So I got both sets of memes. I got to try and sort it out. But you can see here that there's no opportunity for like introducing complexity into this issue. There's no opportunity for actually correcting the record about who said what or being objective you know, about the facts of this. It's very difficult to do this in the world of memes, or at least I think it is. I mean, it is true. So the, the algorithms, if you click on one thing, it's gonna lead you down the road, right? So you, you, know, you click on one thing and if you're leaning a little bit, it just keeps getting more and more extreme until that's all you're getting. So that's one part of the algorithm. And the other part of the algorithm is they figured out that the most engagement you can get is if you are enraged, but, can't do anything about it. So they're always sending you stuff, putting stuff in your feed that makes you mad, but makes you feel helpless too. And so it's like, you know, I have a friend who sends me all this stuff constantly. I'm like, you're just, just try to get out of the algorithm. They're just send, you know, just 
go out, touch grass, as they say, yeah. just go outside, just try to get out because this they know that this keeps you clicking along. I it's very difficult for me to see how to break through that except from breaking out of it. Can't be good for your mental health either. It's not good for your mental health. I mean, it's proven to be terrible for your mental health. Like, imagine being in a state of helpless rage all day long. Not good. Not good. No, it's terrible. So, he does say in the sentence before that that you can apply these questions to situations in which you encounter art and media and the intersections of real life. Try to be in real life as much as possible. Play politics and creative expression. That's all good. It's hard for me to believe that it's only me and Amy in this next class. Anthropological theory for the 21st century, right here in this room, 1010 to 1130 on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the history of anthropological thought. I've decided we're gonna read this edited volume. The only thing I don't like about this edited volume is for the 21st century, because I never know what century we're in. And it seems like, 21st is that ahead of us or behind us is that where we where we are the century they're just one ahead one ahead yeah have i quizzed you on that already so if it's like the 18th century you're in 1700s <laughs> and it makes no sense <laughs> i mean it does make sense but it makes no sense yeah so i'm retitling this book it's going to be called anthropology for a changing world or better, I think, anthropology for changing the world. You see, if you just change that one thing around, 